Welcome everybody to the Brand Fortress HQ podcast. I'm your host, John Stojan, and today I'm excited to have Elizabeth Green from Jungler with us. Um, Elizabeth Green has been involved in the Amazon space, um, running her agency, um, and really focusing on helping sellers get to that eight-figure mark. Um, she knows a thing or two about uh, uh, being an expert at scaling um, with simplicity, and on her personal life, she has uh, six kids from the ages of five to 13 that she races with her husband. Um, and she takes those principles both on Amazon and also in her personal life to really move brands forward. So, uh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, no, yeah, thanks no, for having thanks me, for when, having you me were, when you were, when you reached when you out, reached you're like, out, hey, I want hey, you to be one of the first uh, people uh, on the podcast. On the podcast. Like, wow, I, feel, wow, I, feel, I feel honored. I feel honored. So thanks so much, so much for having me. Yeah. So for folks that aren't familiar with you, I'd love to dive a little bit into your background. But before we do that, I do have to ask. So, um, you know, six kids under the A between five and 13, um, while running, um, a, a, you know, a top notch agency. Um, talk to me a little bit about how you find that balance, because I have two kids and my wife and I are like, OK, it was too scary to go from man to man to to zone defense. So yeah, yeah. Uh, what are some of those things that uh, you feel like transfer really well uh, between those two worlds? Yeah, yeah I, I probably just, just working to working simplify, to simplify and, prioritize. and prioritize. It's a trick. It's a trick. I think it's a, trick, it's to life, a trick to life. When you, right have, more when you have more things, things to manage, to manage it, it, it definitely becomes, it definitely becomes uh, uh, I cannot, I cannot survive, survive unless I learn how to do this. this. Yeah. So probably a probably lot of, a lot of uh, uh, things that, things that, that, that cross things over. And and I feel like sometimes I get asked that question. Yeah, okay. Just remember already out your non-negotiables. Try and not worry about the rest of it. As much as you possibly can. And then I look then at I look what at I'm doing in business, business or clients, or clients, I'm like, clients ah, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right. Okay, right. okay, okay take I gotta take advice. my advice. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta relearn that lesson. <laughs> so it's kind of re a reinforcement between those those two worlds. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, it, no, it, it definitely. It definitely it, it, I think how, how um, I do, do, do everything, everything is not, is not everything, 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 really, really. Um, so um, major, so it major choices, choices is, is mostly just mostly how just I live like my personal life. Personal life is pretty chill. Pretty chill. Um, um, but that but that means, means that I'm not, I'm not running around trying, around trying to get everything, everything done, done, and that's honestly how I make work. Prioritizing non-negotiables, allowing myself not not stress about what I what I believe are little things. Gotcha. And I could see how that would serve you really well on Amazon because I feel like as time goes on, there's a lot more shiny objects and little bells and whistles and all these different things that yeah, yeah. we can ch chase that Amazon loves to give us. Um, and quite frankly, as brands, we you know love to give ourselves at the same time where it's driving mm -hmm. traffic from off Amazon and this ad type and that ad type and creative and all these other types of things, but really focusing on you know where you can have the most leverage and kind of, like you said, how you want to play that game. So I think that... Yeah, um, yeah. You know, that's a really good way for brands to look at it and think about more strategically um, how they want to move forward. So um, before we kind of dive into, you know, what I, you're really good at ads and that type of stuff, um, for folks that aren't familiar with you, uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Um, did you start out, you know, like, hey, uh, I know I want to do this Amazon thing or what did it look like before you got involved with Amazon? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, short so story, story is my main gig was gig stay, stay at home mom. mom. And for context, for context we, have we have a lot of kids. We also have all, all of them. them. Um, so um, life so is life definitely, definitely crazy, crazy with that. With that. Um, um, with a with side, a side gig, gig of an Amazon, Amazon seller. seller. I think it's probably good. Probably good. Put it. Put it. Um, um, did other did other things before. We're trying to work. Trying to work on like that online. You know, some sort of flexible job. Job with the intent of you know having having some sort of income income that allows me to. To to together, be together, together, my husband, my husband, co founder, co founder, um, um and, and which, which was, was arbitrage, arbitrage, dragon, 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 dragon,
or when we got or when started, we got started before, the, before the targeting types got types split, got out, split out, out in the auto campaign, which was bad. Which was bad. Which was bad. Which was bad. Which was like 2018. When that happened, when that happened, everybody was like, oh my gosh, the biggest thing is like, like they, they started starting up and being all out, all out, all out, all out, and they and they tapped off. It seems like it seems like it's made color. The conversation for that happened without having it was, um, um, do I need do to I run, need to run this or this question is how, how, how do I run? It's mm. become much more significant. Yeah, and I think that that's a, a good point of just having that length of time to have um, live through kind of the different um, iterations of Amazon because I feel like every six months or so we go through this uh, process. We're like, oh, there's this big change coming on Amazon and everything's going to change and it's all going to be different. And in the reality of it yeah. is, is that these come constantly and, you know, brands that succeed learn how to, how to adapt. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. brands who don't adapt um, usually don't uh, aren't able to compete and stay around real long. Um, I'm curious when you started out at arbitrage, are there any things that you remember from kind of the arbitrage days that were kind of ridiculous products or things that were, you were like, how is this somebody, people really buy this? I don't think I remember anything ridiculous. We weren't really large scale. I did learn very quickly, make sure that not only is a product sellable, but it's ungated. <laughs> 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 I, that list. I was like, oh, this is awesome. This is something for great. Look how cheap it is. I'm like, oh, shoot. <laughs> it's a brand that I'm not allowed to stop. That's a hard list to learn. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's one of those moments where you kind of shake your fist at the computer for a few minutes as you uh, struggle with Amazon that I feel like we've we've all been through. So you made the switch from arbitrage over to private label. Um, are, are you, uh, okay. Sharing what you, uh, what used to sell private label? Yeah, no, super like small consumable products. Um, I, I always say, um, we did Amazon the way you should not get into an Amazon <laughs> business, which is like, Hey, let's try this. Let's dip our toes in the water, which I mean, like context for back then, I think that was kind of viable. Now, to your point of things getting much more sophisticated and needing to know your numbers, um, there was less competition, which means there's more wiggle room to get things wrong because you're not like it's not as cutthroat. Um, so it was I it was small potatoes like can consumables um, kitchenware. OK, very cool. And I think that that's such a, a, a good you know, proving ground is seeing it from that brand perspective and private mm -hmm. label um, and really understanding working with brands, you know, people that start out with yeah. sellers, I feel like have a very different perspective than, you know, if you're working with an agency or even somebody within an agency that's never actually been a seller themselves, um, it doesn't mean that they can't be good at being, um, you know, an, an advertiser or a creative or, you know, those other roles that we need on Amazon. Um, but I think it does give you a unique perspective when you've had your own product, tried building your own brand on Amazon and kind of have, I think, a closer understanding of what those struggles feel like. Um, so how did you transition from private label into um, starting the agency? Yeah, so this was back before the Facebook groups were kind of a mess. They're a bit mess now, and it seems like everyone's kind of moved on to LinkedIn, which is by far my biggest platform for um, putting out content. But um, like I said, the the autos were getting split out in the – or the targeting was getting split out in the autos. Um, placement percentages kind of rolled out. So there was a lot of shifts and changes to the platform, and there was, so there's a lot of people asking questions. Um, and the Facebook groups were a really big source. And I credit people um, who got started well before me at really developing and bringing in a really good space for sellers to ask those questions. Um, like I said, now it's a bit of a, uh, a mess, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> That's like, probably people the nicest way to put it. Yeah. And, and I don't know. I'm, I'm listening or like watching some of the comments now. I'm like... No, no, <laughs> no, it's so bad. But back in the day, you could get some really good solid answers. Um, 
And so people started naturally asking questions about Amazon advertising. Like I said, context was, do I need to run ads? So there's a lot of people trying to figure it out. Like, can I start small budgets? Like, where should Mm -hmm. I start? What should that look like? And because we had, I had the experience, I all had the answers to the questions. Um, So I was, you know, just kind of looking at getting back into selling a little bit more after my twins were born. Um, And so I would just I was in those groups and so I started answering people's questions and then led to someone going, Oh, hey, do you guys, you know, could you help with this? And I'm like, well, sure. Um, so kind of how we got started and my current marketing philosophy is be really nice, give as much as possible, and it always seems to come back in dividends. So that's really how we got started. Okay. And then, you know, for today, uh, well, you know, fast forwarding to where things are today, I think uh, something to take away for listeners and something that I personally do is, you know, think about uh, or be very careful of where you're getting that advice from. Because I feel yeah. like now there's, you know, ever there's a thousand different opinions on something, especially something as complex as Amazon mm-hmm. ads and Amazon PPC. It's gotten a lot more complex. And so that's where uh, I personally, you know, I have a list of uh, people on LinkedIn um, you being one of those people where, um, you know, looking at our content or if I, I've got questions, um, I think that's one of the beautiful things about um, LinkedIn is, is that you can reach out yeah. to people in the comments and that type of stuff, and you can still get really good answers. You just have to be very careful mm-hmm. about the source of your information is going to really matter a lot uh, as far as the quality of the answer that you get. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think it really has to do with one, just things getting a heck ton more complicated and it also getting much more competitive. So there's less room for error these days where before, if you're paying like 10 cent cost per clicks, yeah, if you get, you know, 10 clicks, you're spending a dollar that wiggle room on error is uh, any, any clicks, you know, without any conversions, of course, we would rather everything always convert all the time. It's not going to. (laughs) So, but my, my investment for those tests is significantly less, you know, five years ago versus now if I'm paying $2 a click, well, you know, (laughs) I get 10 clicks. That's the, you know, that's a decent chunk. I mean, obviously 20, $20 is not going to kill you. Uh, hopefully, but um, if, if you extrapolate that out times testing, you know, 5, 10, 20 keywords, that can add up really, really fast. And so I think that's where um, really, to your point, vetting what information you're getting, where you're getting from it, how, how reliable is the source. <laughs> you want to make sure that, you know, you're not wasting all of that money because you got, you got some kind of bad advice. Yeah. And so I'm curious, you know, one thing that, uh, that you mentioned there, and and I see this a lot is, um, how much Amazon has changed in the sense of, uh, I kind of feel like we as, as brands, um, got spoiled, you know, really in that kind of, you know, 2015, 2016 until about 2020, where, you know, you could, you know, at one time you could even bring things directly over from Alibaba and you could make a lot of money yeah. selling on Amazon. And that was, Hey, I just need to modify the product a little bit. Um, and now it's, a, uh, you know, getting a lot more challenging. I'm curious, how does that discussion go with some of your, you know, especially the new clients that come in, um, to you as an agency, as far as like, Hey, we want to be back to, you know, 15% ACOS and 5% tacos. And we hit those numbers in 2019. So now we want to hit them in, you know, 2024. Um, are you still seeing those conversations? And if so, what's kind of your take on that? Um, I do have those conversations on occasion. Um, I, right now we can be a little bit more picky with the brands that we take on. And so we try and partner with brands who we know that we can succeed with. Um, so if your expectation is for a 5% total A cost, um, just because of how my brain works and how I'm able to make sense of it is mathematically. Um, so the way I would make sense or have that conversation, at least for me, again, because this is my comfort zone, um, I have other uh, team leads who are like, oh my gosh, I can't do that math on the fly. I'm like, it's just how my brain works. So I'm feeling, you know, you, you can't do it's good work if you can't do math on the fly. But for me, it's like, okay, you know, 5% 
let's let's do like short math you know five percent or let's do ten percent so my brain can make it work you know ten percent of ten thousand is a thousand dollars and if you take okay so that's my ad spend because that's mm-hmm. what the percentage looks like um i'm a big act for get for figuring out how much sometimes just that is illuminating um so for example if maybe the brand has lost market share and maybe they're dealing with sales, hopefully not, but you know, if they're playing it that close to us, it might be dealing with market share loss. And so they're like, oh, we want 5%. And you're like, well, 5% when you were doing it three years ago, you know, you only had to spend $5,000. And now because things have decreased, you know, that 5% might only be a couple grand. Like percentages sometimes can get you. Um, so I'm a huge advocate for like, okay, well, what does that percentage look like? And then what are our costs per clicks look like? And how many costs per clicks does that ad budget support? And what you'll find when you do those mathematics is it becomes very illuminating. You're like, oh, wow, I can only get half the clicks I used to for the same ad budget. Hopefully it's not half. Hopefully it's maybe a little <laughs> bit higher than that. But I mean, in some marketplaces it is. And or the brands will say, oh, you know, we used to rank on this main keyword. Um uh, a lot of it comes down to how competitive the products are in this space, uh, meaning how good the conversion rates are. And that's one thing that I've really um, been happy with. I think it's particularly 2023, um, Amazon's push to really uh, get more data into the hands of sellers, particularly data surrounding co- competition in the form of the search query performance report, there's now the product opportunity explorer brand uh, brand metrics inside of the ad console there's all of these ways now where you can benchmark your conversion rates your stats against your competition and it used to be brands would ask like hey how are we doing versus our competitors i mean like everybody wants to know that like right am i am i still competitive how am i doing am i falling behind and it used to be like well you're ranking on more keywords than helium 10 says your competition is so i guess we're good but there wasn't any real true defined numbers where now there's first party data that says hey we're lagging behind what our competitors are doing. And that's probably the reason we're losing market share. It might not necessarily be that we're not running as sophisticated ads. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. I'll do a shameless plug, go get an audit. We'll give you one for free. (laughs) But, um, you know, like there it's, it's way more all encompassing these days to your point of the competition. Um, that's really why you have to look at it from all facets is there, there's many more people who are offering something to the consumer that they might, as much as it's painful to admit sometime like more than your product or your listing. And that's where most brands run into trouble with market share is not doing what Amazon is focused on and continuously looking at the consumer and say, how can we serve them better? Yeah, I think that's well. Two things that I think are really important there is first of all, and, and I've seen brands really hurt themselves by essentially trying to stream up, uh, you know, swim upstream uh, with mm-hmm. Amazon, where they're trying to fight the system. Whether that be try, hey, I know that my audience, you know, um, will buy off this keyword, and even though they have the ad data, that is probably some of the best data that you can get that proves otherwise. Um, or they're trying to, you know, fulfill by merchant because they like that better than FBA or, you know, whatever, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a bunch of different things where they're essentially fighting Amazon and like, you're, it's going to be really hard for you if you're fighting Amazon. Um, and then the other thing that I I think that's really important that you brought up, um, and I know, uh, you know, I feel like it's getting a little bit more love, but probably not as much love as it, it really deserves, which is that search query report. Yeah. Um, because it's one thing to know, hey, my product converts at you know ten percent, and I can look and I can say, okay, the category average is seven percent, so great, I'm doing well. But with that search query report, you can really dive into, okay, which of these keywords am I doing mm-hmm. best on, and where is that opportunity? Um, what else you know, from that search query report do you find you know really helpful um, and maybe something that uh, uh, you look at on a consistent basis. Yeah, I think main one is conversion rates, also click-through rates, and just like your share 
of um, the traffic. One thing to keep in mind for anyone who's not dived into search query reports, you've probably seen these questions all over the place. People are like, wait, why is the volume in search queries so much lower than what I'm seeing in my advertising? Like I can explicitly say like, oh, I got, you know, 10 sales through this one search if I look at my advertising and yet search query performance is telling me that I only got five sales. That makes no sense. <laughs> and I would say it has to do with the differences. Whenever you're combining uh, different data sets on Amazon, you need to be very clear as to how those data sets are reported. That's why uh, sessions in the business support will contain advertising metrics, but clicks and sessions are not a one-to-one -one as far as how they're reported. You end up with like weirdness like that. And that's the same with the search query report. So whenever you're comparing things with like apples to apples, meaning to your point, search query is insanely powerful. What is my conversion rate? versus my competition within the same report, within the same data set, um, then you're going to get some really good information. Now that can be helpful to your point to carry that over into advertising, which is something we definitely do. And, you know, where am I converting better than my competition? Where am I may, maybe not pushing my ads as heavy as I could be, even though I know I'm doing better than my competitors. So that's a great point for us to then go into the ad console make those changes and then push the product to ideally gain more market share there. Um, so again, it could be really, really helpful. But again, if you're trying to do apples to apples on stuff, there's so many reports that don't line up. To be honest, it's infuriating, but <laughs> there's so many reports <laughs> that don't line up uh, in Amazon. It's and I think that's a great point because everybody expects that when they, you know, data coming first party from data coming first party from Amazon is really useful. And we have more data than mm -hmm. we've ever had before, which is fantastic. Um, but there are limitations to those data and, and understanding that, you know, as infuriating as it can be, looking at that change over time, you know, at least what I found is, is more important than necessarily mm -hmm. trying to get all the data to line up perfectly to say, hey, are we moving in the right direction or are we not? And thinking of it, you know, yeah. more as a compass as opposed to a roadmap. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. So, at, you know, talking about um, Amazon ads getting a lot more complicated, what are, you know, maybe in the last six to 12 months, um, the big changes that you are seeing um, and how ads have gotten a lot more complicated? Yeah. Um, so in the beginning, uh, when I say the beginning, you know, kind of like when we started up and then ongoing, it's been a lot more um, control levers that they've given us. So for example, the, um, placement percentages, when those come out, holy heck, everybody freaked out. Everybody's like, how the heck do I use it? So it's, <laughs> it's understanding how to leverage that, you know, with, uh, everything is driving towards trying to leverage all of the updates to enact better ad spend performance. Really at the end of the day, advertising management is about good ad spend management. Uh, so it's just understanding how to pull on that level or lever. What are the things that enact on that lever? Um, again, how can I showcase myself to better audiences? Um, then we got access to things like, um, you know, sponsor display came into the ad console. I, ASIN targeting, that was huge when that came out. So just a lot more control because back in the day on occasion, um, it was mostly through vendor accounts, but you could get like some sponsor display placements from the auto. So it would like randomly show up, but there was little control. And now it's like, okay, here's a sponsor display ad. Here's product targeting, um, you know, go ham with that. And then there was like audiences, but now there's like look back window. So there's, there's all these ways that we can segment and control who our ads are served to. And then to your point, how much, or to the point of like ad spend control, how much are we paying when we serve these ads? Um, cause that's the problem with let's like, say auto campaigns or other sort of conglomerations is when I show up here, I have this one lever, which is my bid or potentially my, uh, campaign budget that controls all these different placements, all these search placements, all these product page placements. It's I have one lever that controls everything. So how I can control this one thing is reduced to impossible. So with all of these additional layered controls and specifics, we got more access and more capabilities to say, okay, I want to show up exactly here 
And this is specifically how much I'm willing to pay for that placement. And I, I can, I can move levers much more incrementally now, which is fabulous. That means if you're a really good account manager, you can get some stellar results. It also means there's a lot to keep track of. <laughs> like <laughs> there's so many, like there, oh, it's like, oh, if I build it out like this and if I, you know, I can show up here, if I put this in here and do this. And so that was the one thing that we saw was just a, a movement towards more and more incremental control. Um, towards the end of 2023, there were a lot of changes that took away that control. Um, in the form of what search terms are triggered by match types. Uh, we saw an expansion of the search terms that are potentially triggered through broad match and sponsored product ads. Then we saw an expansion of the search terms that are triggered through exact match in sponsored brand campaigns. We saw, I'm trying to think what the other one was. There was, there was one other one that like changed it. Um, Oh, uh, the off placement settings, um, which that is still like a very marginal amount of ad spend, but Amazon opened up sponsored product ads to now show off platform in some very limited case. And, but there, there's no uh, like incremental levers of control on those play. It just, it happens somewhere. <laughs> we don't know. We can, we can't stop it. We can't do anything about it. Um, it just happens and there's, there's no control over it. Um, so that's been kind of interesting to navigate again, kind of figuring out, okay, when I can't control this, like what are the levers I can pull? What are the things that are in my control? What are the things that aren't in my control to the point going back, trying to simplify and make your life easier. It's like, all right, these are the things, <laughs> you know, the, oh, what is that? That's saying, you know, Lord, give me strength to control the things I can and to let go of the things that I can't. I feel like I'm saying it a lot these days. Um, but it's, and again, it's, it's really trying to understand as this kind of thing becomes more and more complicated, again, understanding the levers, the things that are within your control, and then understanding what is the best way to, again, get the most efficiency out of my ad spend, giving the things that I have at my disposal. Yeah, I think that those are, you know, some great points in there as far as how things are changing, where like exact targets aren't exact as they were six months ago. Um, yeah. and some of the other changes that we're seeing. So from a brand perspective, um, you know, for somebody that, you know, they're trying to look at it from more of a, you know, 10,000 foot level as the brand, and maybe they're in the ads every day, or maybe they have somebody that's doing that for them. Um, how do you, you know, how do you think about, um, from a big picture, setting those goals and then, um, executing on goals for a brand? Yeah, the biggest thing that I don't want to say we developed this last year, more like uh, definitely solidified as a really key um, ad, I don't know if you call it like a framework or a philosophy uh, when it comes to really helping brands, your point, grow sales, which typically means growing ad spend in a very competitive landscape where you tend to get like less efficiency for how much you're spending, less scale for how much you're spending, yet you can't infinitely scale that and just push a brand into unprofitability. Um, and that has been this idea of managing strategy on a per product level. And when I say per product, I mean per listing or per parent ASIN. I kind of use all of those listing ASIN product our parent ASIN interchangeably. Um, the reason why we choose per listing as opposed to say per SKU or per child ASIN um, would be that that is the way that the traffic is funneled through ads. You, you essentially land on a listing. Yes, you land on a specific child ASIN, but they are within that you know listing in case there's lots of variations, uh, which can help simplify things a little bit as um, we ended up along the way managing several like large clothing brands. And so the complexity is if you zoom out or go down to a SKU level can be like unhelpful. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, so we, we've since rolled it up to the listing level and that, that has helped to make much more sense of larger complex accounts. Um, and then further than that, looking at um, ad spend and total sales attributions um, through a percentage of totals uh, lens. 
Um, so again, I'm a huge fan of, okay, we know that this one is this bestseller by how much? Is your bestseller driving 75% of your total sales volume or is it driving 25% of your total sales volume? The impact of those two product lines uh, if you have a product driving 75%, you better watch that thing like a hawk. As goes, as goes that product, so goes the account. If you had to focus on nothing other than keeping that bestseller in stock, that would be well worth your time. Now, you probably want to look deeper into the catalog to see if you can kind of get off of that like <laughs> uh, sole focus and all of your eggs in one basket, but that that immediately adds such clarity as to where my focus goes. Um, versus if I had say three to four products that are making up, you know, that sort of big t top chunk of my sales volume. Now I have three to four places to focus on and where I find that brands can really screw themselves profitability wise is not taking a very strong look at that. Um, so we look at terms of impact again, we're factoring in ad spend percentages as well, just because again, we're an ad agency. So we need to keep that in mind. We look at percentage of total sales, percentage of total ad spend again on a per listing level, um, to gauge impact. And then what we're doing is we're zooming out and we're looking again for us, it's things that are related to the ads. You also could do this with, uh, factoring in profitability as well. So it's like impact on the total account. Then what we call, again, for us, we call ad efficiencies, meaning a cost, total a cost percentage of what we call ad sale percentage, which is like what percentage of my total sales are coming from advertising, ad conversion rate versus unit session percentage. So we're looking at impact and then we're looking at efficiency on that impact. So if I have a high impact item that's struggling with say profitability, well, even if it is the best seller, if it's not bringing in the most revenue, it's probably actually not my point to focus on. Um, so if you can, and then you start managing ad strategy to those buckets. So I said, okay, these are my top buckets. These are the ones where I probably should allocate the most time, resources, spend, strategy. But the problem that happens a often time is that brands won't do a thorough analysis on um, their, their product lines. This happens all the, you know, like, over the years, you launch a whole bunch of products and there's kind of some out there that are like the ones that like, ah, I launched that a year ago. And now I feel like, and I hear so many brands and I, I sympathize where they're kind of stuck in this limbo and they're like, I know I have these product lines. I don't feel like they've gotten a fair shake. So I don't really want to discontinue them because I feel as if there might be something there. I have all these products that are already on Amazon. I already got the factory coming. Like, already have everything in place if I could just get this thing to work, but I don't know if it's not working just because there's no traffic or is it a dead product? I don't know. So they kind of like, they look at it every once in a while or every six months and they're like, ah, I have no idea what to do. I ah, just don't think about it. And it runs for another six months. And next thing you know, there's three years later and they have this really large catalog. So oftentimes what happens is an ad agency will come in or somebody will say, oh, okay, I want to grow my brand. So they'll start shoving ad spend into every single bucket. And what happens is that you're going to have products with high efficiencies in ad spend, meaning typically because they have really strong conversion rates, they have really strong market share, they're strong products. It's really easy to push those and see significant returns. But then you oftentimes, if you're putting it into the rest of the, again, that bottom half of the catalog where you're like, I want to see if this works. If you build out a really robust and, um, really significant ad spend strategy, oftentimes the the sales volume of those products just can't support that. It makes no sense. So that's where you end up with wild profitability when everybody's like, oh, I just want to test and grow sales. And the next thing you know, like your total A cost doubles and you're like, well, I didn't want to get no profits this month. That wasn't the goal. <laughs> um, so it, it's about just kind of understanding, again, how each product line relates to that sales growth, to that profitability, and then making strategic decisions um, based on the impact. Yeah. And I think that the first steps of that, um, most brands probably have a gut instinct, but actually doing the math and looking at it, of, yeah. okay, over the last 30 days, 60 days, six months and 12 months, you know, what does my spread looks like, look like for those pro you know, of my products that are driving that mm -hmm. revenue. And I, I mean, I feel like this is such an old trope, but it's still so true, which is, is that, you know, probably 20% of your products are driving 80% of your revenue and yep. profit. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think it's so 
that's a great point. And I like how you kind of explained, you know, the, the action, the impact portion of it to go beyond just, okay, here's my top line sales, but also look at, you know, where I'm allocating my ad spend mm -hmm. um, and putting those, you know, kind of seems obvious when you say it out loud, but I, you know, I agree with you. I've seen it so many times where, um, you know, they're putting their ad spend in a product that quite frankly, isn't really working because they're hoping that it's going to work at the yeah. expense of, you know, a tried and true product that, you know, really has done well over time and continues to do well, maybe not 2018 well, but still, you mm -hmm. know, delivers really, really well. Um, so I'm curious when you have that, you know, discussion with brands, um, what, what are kind of, um, your criteria and, and, and or, or how do you think about this? And maybe, you know, obviously brands might feel differently, but as a, a little bit of an outside observer where you go, you know, um, it's time to retire this product um, and maybe try something new. Yeah, um, where we come in is we'll often just give advice. Um, say like, hey, this is what we're seeing in the market. This is what we're seeing. Um, and a lot of it is just mathematics, right? Like if your conversion rate is 2%, and the cost per click is $2, um, you can actually factor on average, it's actually pretty easy. So you factor on average, how many clicks does it take to convert to a sale, which is one divided by uh, your conversion rate in decimal form. And then you say, okay, now that I have, oh great, it takes me 50 clicks to convert to a sale. That's a <laughs> lot. And now if I'm even paying just a dollar on those clicks, that's $50 to convert to an order on average, right? You're going to have some keywords that work better, some keywords are not, and it becomes very illuminating. And all of a sudden you go, wait, why am I doing this investment? This, this makes no sense. It's going to be very difficult to make this thing work. It's going to be very difficult to make this thing profitable. Um, and it's not because a lot of times it's not because the brands are doing anything wrong from an advertising perspective. Don't get me wrong. I've seen some doozies <laughs> in the audits, but um, for the, a lot of times it's just they're going up against a very competitive market and the conversion rates are not strong enough to sustain how competitive they're being with the ads. Um, so you pivot, you try and find a less competitive way um, to get the product out there, or maybe you pull back and just say, well, this product's going to do what it's going to do, but I can no longer afford to continuously move, lose money on this product line. Um, so it's, it's really just having the conversation like that. And there will be a lot of times where, um, again, just due to the product kind of sitting there, well, we'll make the recommendation like, hey, you know, it doesn't make sense to push this product and the brand will come back with, yeah, we know that and we've kind of known it for a while. But we also have like a significant stock investment here. So we mm. need you to can keep doing what you're doing because, you know, there's extenuating reasons. So those kind of conversations are why I'm hesitant to say like, all right, let's just not advertise. <laughs> you know, we're, we're gonna make an executive decision here. Um, it's more interfacing with them and saying, okay, what does the brand need? Okay, yeah, the inventory levels are that. All right, let's see what we can maintain here. Okay, we're not gonna get profitable, but, um, you know, given slight on profitability versus massive storage fees in three months, let's just see what we can push out the door now, knowing that that's going to be cheaper than a removal order. You know, like there, there's, there's ways you should look at it as opposed to just saying, okay, given the numbers and my report that I'm looking at, that gives me no context on your business structure. I feel like we should right. be doing this. Right. And I think, you know, kind of back to what you were talking about before, which is just having that plan and, and identifying that mm -hmm. too. You know, it doesn't mean that you need to fire sale it or you need to, you know, recall, recall all that inventory for a product that's not working, but you should have a plan for exiting out of that product um, or at least transitioning to a point where, you know, maybe instead of being that, you know, home run that you were hoping it was going to be, that ends up being mm -hmm. a base hit. And sometimes that's okay when, you know, you have products in there where, you may only sell, you know, 50, 100, 200 of them a month, but because you're not trying to push them harder than what the market is mm -hmm. ready for, you know, you can take uh, some incremental wins that actually add up pretty nicely when you look at your, you know, net profit at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. No, I would 100% agree with that. So I have one noted here uh, as far as, you know, kind of advice. Um, from you uh, that you submitted. And I'm uh, curious to hear your thoughts on um, how to identify and fix your mixed ad spend. Um, tell me a little bit about what you mean by fixed ad spend and and um, what brands uh, should be looking at. 
Yes, uh, that is a that's a great one. So that is one of the roadblocks to how I'm saying like, oh, we should get incremental strategy and we need to be doing it on a per listing level and we need to get granular and we need to, you know, have good ad spend control. Uh, mixed ad spend is a roadblock to that and you cannot fix your incremental strategy until you fix the mixed ad spend. Um, so I should define what it is. <laughs> mixed ad spend for us, at least how we classify it, is campaigns that contain uh, products on more than one listing. It's typically what I mean. Um, the reason why that can be a problem is to going to back to the point of like priority products, things we're pushing, things we're not pushing. Um, if we go in and we identify that, okay, this main product, we think we should significantly invest more ad spend in it. And then, you know, these other lesser products, we need to pull back ad spend. If I have like, let's go extreme. Let's say if I had one campaign for all of my products, which is a terrible idea, never do that. Like you need more <laughs> than one campaign with everything. But like, that would be the very extreme example. I would go, okay, I need to increase ad spend here. And to the point of going back to like the ad spend control and like what, how many levers you have to pull in that control, I got one. I got one campaign. <laughs> so if I wanted to be more aggressive here, be less aggressive here, I have to build out that ad structure before I can even implement that strategy. And that's why that becomes um, just sort of a, a really big issue um, when it comes to, again, really scaling up. The thing that a lot of, I, I don't know if it's a, a misconception, um, but a lot of people will hear of like mixed campaigns where there, there's a common, which I would agree with, um, ad structure of like one campaign, one ad group, one product line, or some people do like one ASIN or one SKU or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people hear that and think, oh, that's going to perform the best. And that's why you guys are saying that. The thing is, is that that's not true. Oftentimes these like mixed campaigns or I lovingly call them Franken campaigns, you know, the ones with like 20 different ad groups and half of them are paused and you got like <laughs> random stuff you tested in there and you're looking at it and you're like, man, the ACOS on this is killer. Like this is, it works really well. And it's the, the structure we advocate for is not because the Franken campaigns don't work. Sometimes to our absolute annoyance, <laughs> They work better than anything else we're doing yeah. incrementally. But where you run into problems is, again, that mixed ad spend and the limited amounts of things that you can control on a per product level. And that's where that really starts to hinder your scale if you're looking at, okay, I really want to get intentional with my ad strategy. You find that your options are limited to none if that's the only ad strategy you're running. Yeah, and I think that's important for people to take away is, is that the amount of control that it gives you um, when you have a much more granular structure. And so um, just to kind of give an example, so if you had all your products and you had it in a campaign and it had a $100 budget uh, for each day, you know, essentially what you're doing is you're saying you're handing Amazon that $100 and say, hey, you spend it how you think is best. Now, the Amazon mm -hmm. algorithm is fairly smart. So like you said, sometimes those Franken campaigns, Amazon will figure it out um, and you'll actually end up with a pretty decent result. The problem is, is that, you know, if a campaign goes sideways or something changes, you know, like you said, you don't really have the controls to make those adjustments. And so you're just kind of stuck with mm -hmm. what Amazon gives you. Um, whereas, like you said, if you break that out a little bit more, and I'm personally a big fan of breaking out as much as you possibly mm -hmm. can within reason. Now, you know, um, yeah. we don't need to go to the other end of, the, I know there's the other end of the spectrum that's like, hey, every product, every keyword needs to have its own separate campaign. Um, that's a whole different separate issue. But as much as you can kind of handle based on, you know, whether you're using bulk sheets or whatever software that you use, um, just gives you more control. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, um, that's a good uh, piece of advice for brands out there as they think about their, you know, their ad campaigns of just, uh, and, and as, you know, Amazon's going to evolve, things are going to change, but really the more control that you can have over being able to distri uh, distribute, you know, your, your bids, your ads, your budget, all those different things um, to whatever products that you want to, 
um, the more flexibility and success that you're going to see in the long run mm -hmm. in the ad platform. Um, yep. So Elizabeth, anything else that uh, you want to leave listeners with before we wrap up that um, you think uh, as the platform evolves that you see um, that they should be paying attention to? Yeah, um, no, I think we I think we pretty much covered it. I mean, those are me my overarching tips is watch your mixed ad spend, look at things on a per listing level. As far as things that should be watched on going, um, I'm definitely going to say watch those search term reports closely. Uh, to your point of things having a little bit less control and things popping up, the search term reports are where we've discovered that. Yeah, great advice. Well, for people that maybe are out there and they're, you know, they feel like they're, um, not getting the results that they want, um, I would encourage them um, to reach out to uh, you for, you guys do a free audit uh, for brands. Yep. So, so all of all of that, those things I've been talking about, look on it on a per product level. Do you have mixed ad spend? What does the structure look like? Yeah, all that's in the audit because we wanna know. We wanna know what we're getting into <laughs> as much as you do. <laughs> Perfect, so the, for the brands out there that are like, okay, that's all great information, but I just, I feel really stuck. Um, you know, that's a, a great opportunity for them. And then for anybody who's listening, um, where's the best place for them to um, get kind of the latest and, and greatest from Elizabeth Green on all the different things that you're finding for uh, Amazon ads? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, if you're interested in the audit, a web, the website's going to be the best place to go, uh, jungler.com, J-U-N-G-L-R.com. Um, as far as getting the latest and greatest, LinkedIn is definitely where I'm putting out the most content, although I'm trying to ramp it up on YouTube this year. Um, we'll see how I do. I always, you know, you start off the year strong. We'll see. Um, <laughs> but part of that is actually going live every Thursday to answer Amazon ad questions. Um, so far, we've been doing that consistently. So um, that would be another great source of information. If you want to ask a question, I'd like to think I know what I'm talking about when it comes to ads. We were talking about sources or good quality sources of information. So feel free to tune in on Thursdays. Awesome. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Uh, just happy to have you. Yeah, no, thanks so much. It's been an honor. I appreciate it.